And welcome back to another episode of Containers from the Couch. I hope you missed us from last week. We are back again with another show. And today we have actually one of my favorite kind of things is not people from AWS speaking, but rather our customers who are actually using our services. So I'm going to let Boaz and Alan introduce themselves. And I'll come back again, just give you a quick intro afterwards. So Boaz, can you tell everybody who you are, what you're doing here, and how you can help everybody else use ECS in an easy way. Excellent. Thank you, Mesh. It's great to be here. My name is Boaz Brudner. I'm the head of SaaS engineering, AI, and architecture uh, for the water lifecycle organization within Autodesk. And today we'll talk about how we leverage containers and other AWS services to provide our customers with a seamless way to run high scale compute simulations for water. With me, thank now. you. And Alan. Hi, um, I'm a principal engineer working at Autodesk and the uh, water lifecycle team. And uh, I'm based in the UK. I've been working in that area of uh, software for quite a while, the water lifecycle industry. So I've worked a lot of desktop client server software, written C. Then I made a journey into front end, full stack, you know, web development of various JavaScript frameworks. And then once the sort of cloud revolution came along, started moving more and more loads to the cloud and natural sort of area for building of services is on Node.js and TypeScript. And, and that's what we're sort of continuing to do on that journey. And yeah, it's great to be here as well. Hopefully uh, with Boaz lift lid and a few of the things we do at Autodesk with, with the ECS. Awesome. And my name is May Seidel Casing. I'm a developer advocate with the ECS service team. Um, I want to say hello and give a shout out to everybody there over in the chat, watching us on the live stream, or maybe catching us later also in the recording, which is available either on YouTube or on Twitch channel. Um, say hello in the chat. Tell us know where you're watching us from. And if you have any questions, of course, please pop them in the chat for our guests, who I'm going to actually... Okay, so Boaz, explain to us what is Autodesk and what do you do? Excellent. So. Uh... Autodesk has been around for you know more than 40 years and Autodesk builds software for people who design, build and make things. And more specifically, we are at Autodesk uh, build software for water professionals. These are people who are building such software, building water infrastructure and maintaining that. I'll jump into some some slides that will help us understand a little bit better uh, that uh, that area that we deal with. So first off, a little bit of a safe harbor statement. We might be talking about some things that are future oriented, things like that. Just take that uh, as, as a note. With that, uh, what is water life cycle? Uh, so within Autodesk, we are a department that builds software for water professionals to deal with the entire life cycle of water from planning, design, build, to operate and monitor large water systems. And we've been doing that for more than 25 years. And about three years ago, we were acquired uh, by Autodesk to do that within Autodesk. Now, more specifically, what does that mean? So when we talk about actual products, we have two types of products that we offer our customers. On the left side, you see core desktop solutions. These have been our bread and butter solutions for more than 25 years, dealing with different verticals in the water space. One part is drainage. So designing and optimizing of, of drainage systems for an environment, making sure that water drains effectively in that environment. Storm sewer flood solutions to model and simulate the behavior of water in flood ecosystems. Then water distribution, and that is a set of solutions that model the behavior of clean water uh, uh, that uh, our customers need to bring from the source, rivers and lakes and so forth, to homes and businesses. That's our core desktop solutions. On the right side, we've got newer products that joined, uh, uh, that joined uh, the, the set of products over the past few years. Those are Born in the Cloud SaaS solutions for asset management and operational analytics. So asset management, planning your capital expenses when you change out water systems, pipes, pumps, and things like that. 
and operational analytics. These are real-time solutions that operators use day in, day out to operate their um, water utility or a wastewater or water treatment plant. Now, interestingly, today, we will actually be talking about our desktop solution and what we've built in the cloud to support higher capabilities and better capabilities for these desktop solutions. These are highly effective solutions that have been built for quite some time with a lot of capabilities and a lot of functionality for modelers and engineers. And let's dive into that. So first up, we've been offering a solution for simulation or water simulation for a very long time. Customers for a long time have been able to download our products and then simulate the behavior of water on their desktops. That has been available for a very long time, and that is limited by the desktop capability itself. About 15 years ago, we went to the next level, allowing customers to build an on-prem environment with servers to run large-scale simulations when you need to run multiple simulations at a time. You've got a critical project. Uh, and uh, that was enabled for our customers. But what is the challenge with doing that? So first off, we all know that building an on-prem solution in your data center uh, requires quite an expensive ordeal of figuring out what the requirements are and how you get an IT team to build it out. So that's the first thing. The next thing is usually these types of solution require complex licensing and hardware. So you're not only responsible for the licensing of the products themselves of the product that we offer as Autodesk, but you're also responsible for the licensing of the OS, the databases and others. And of course, the hardware configuration itself, the cards, network cards, uh, graphical cards and everything that comes into that, you are responsible for that. Those are pretty challenging. Next is, I am sure this uh, this relates to a lot of, uh, of our audience, is really to understand capacity planning. So really those questions about how much do you need and trying to figure out, do I need five servers, 10 servers, 20 servers to fit the needs uh, of the use case? not over capacity and not under capacity. Downtime. So things do happen. Hardware gets uh, gets problems, corruption of hard of hard disk or data and things like that. Then what happens is we've got downtime and the IT department is being pulled over to figure this out. That's a challenging task. Now, as a whole, there's a constant trade-off between the modeling teams, which are our customers, and their ability to work efficiently and effectively, and the burden and cost on the IT team, because everything that is happening and you need to take care of is actually a burden on the IT team. And I'm sure a lot of people can relate to that. It's a constant thing. Uh, but as a whole, our solutions have worked really well, especially for our high-end customers that have been able to put the funds to create such a solution and the bandwidth to create those. Uh, and this has been really working well. So we wanted to maintain that and make a solution that works better, but to democratize the ability to run such high-scale capabilities to everybody. So what is it that we've built over the past three to four years to allow our customers to go to that next level without all the IT burden, without the problem? Now, it, it is set on three different pillars. The first one is storage. So we want to provide a storage solution, a storage solution for all of our customers in a seamless way. So We've created a cloud solution to store databases. And we say databases, it means the actual water infrastructure, infrastructure definition and the actual models that you've run. And you'll be able to access them from wherever by multiple users using different desktops in different locations, leveraging the capabilities of the cloud with encryption, with backups, and so forth. So that's storage. The second thing is manage that storage and manage what it is that you expect of that storage to fulfill for you. 
And for that, we've built out a web interface on top of that storage to allow our customers to really manage the life cycle of the content that they have. They're able to back it up, delete, rename, and do whatever they need in order to manage that efficiently. We take all the hard work in terms of actually performing the backups, actually performing the life cycle and so forth. Our customers don't need to do any of that. And the last thing, and this is the, the area that we will focus the most during this discussion is simulations. The ability to simulate the behavior of water is a difficult thing and in some cases require quite an extensive set of cloud uh, of compute capabilities and this is what we provide our customers the ability to seamlessly run simulations at large scale in an elastic way to be able to access compute resources that usually are not available for everybody unless you set them up and at the same time provide that in a seamless way. They use our desktop applications. It's no different than what it was. It's the same environment that they're they used to. Also, we take care of all of the licensing, things that customers don't need to think about. The OS licensing, the hardware, things like that. It's all managed by us and AWS. Last thing is auto automatic updates. You don't need an IT department to go and get a new package of the software to install that, upgrade, downtime, so forth. We deal with all of that. It is a seamless way. Our customers are always able to get the latest updated, what we call engines and some versions that they need in order to maintain backward comp compatibility. So we've had a lot of feedback from lots of customers about that. Um, and this uh, note here from one of our customers is, is kind of indicative of what we get. Um, customers have seen that they've been able to run uh, in the past simulations in a day or three to four hours on higher end compute. Uh, and today we can, they can do that in a much faster way, again, with no setup. They just get the software, download that to their desktop, and they're able to run and just do whatever they need to do to accomplish their work. Mesha, I think you, you're on mute. And I said they don't have to buy the hardware either, which is even better. Yeah, no need to buy anything. They just download the software, install it on their desktop, and they're awesome. able to run right away. Now, with that, I'll touch on a few guidelines that we have when we build software in the cloud uh, that really sets us apart for that activity. So. The first thing is that when we set about, remember, we've had a solution that was running really well. It was really good, really honed in to an environment of a data center. But we wanted to provide the best experience. And in order to get the best experience for our customers, we wanted to leverage the cloud to the max. And to do that, we favored native cloud solution over lift and shift. It's about 95% born in the cloud solution with about 5% lift and shift, only where it's really needed and, in it, and fits in an elegant way. We favor serverless solution and manage uh, compute sources whenever we, whenever we can in an order. If something can run on a Lambda, we will run it on a Lambda. A lot of the work that we have uh, goes into Lambdas. A lot of the functions run in Lambdas, orchestration, things like that with managed services and we try to use that as much as possible. That's the simplest form factor for us. Now, there are cases where a solution cannot run on a Lambda for various reasons, time, size, and so forth. Then we go to containers. And in that case, even with that, we have two levels. Whatever can run on a Fargate solution will run on a Fargate solution because that is fully managed for us. We don't need to deal with the scaling. We don't need to deal with other things on the uh, environment. Fargate is the next best thing for us. Really great. Now, even that, there are cases where we opted to go to ECS standard. So go to that level, which allows us to control the OS. Uh, and specifically, in a lot of cases, that that's when we, use, we, need, we need GPUs or much higher scale. We looked into ECS standard, and we use that. But in general, remember that when you look at some of our architecture, that's the order. We are very uh, 
I would say focused on making sure that we are effective. And being effective means that you need to make some hard choices. One of those hard choices is picking a language across the board where everybody builds software with that same language. And we chose TypeScript because that allows us to transition engineers uh, between different um, different uh, 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 teams, different services very quickly, allows us to share code between different uh, pieces of our services. And for the first time in my career, we have the same language used in the front end and the back end. No more back end teams using something and then front end using something else. In our case, front end and back end teams use the same language, which has been really good. Now, that's not always the case. We do have highly capable or specific computation needs where we fulfill that with either modern Fortran or C++ where we need highly specific things, but that's limited to what Alan will be talking about, the engines. And with that, I'll hand over to Alan to dig into our architecture. Yeah, yeah. thanks, Boaz. Uh, yeah, that gives us good background and where we've come from, what we're trying to do. Uh, I'll just point out, I've only got three slides at most, and they're all architecture diagrams. So. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, but I do have a, a short video to play. So I'll just start. This is the high level architecture diagram of the simulation parts that were Boaz talked about storage and management and so on. But obviously, this is containers, um, container based shows. So we're, uh, this is where the containers live in this simulation side of things. Uh, so it's a bit abstract just looking at architecture diagram. So I was just going to play uh, a little video of a short video of the software that the from what the users see. Um, so I think is that playing? See if I can... Yeah, it's going. Okay. Oh, sorry, it's going. Yeah. Okay. So this, this, this is uh, InfoWorks ICM. This is the desktop modeling software that's used for storm, sewer, flood modeling. So making predictive models, uh, what if scenarios of anything, anything to do with storm, sewer, and flood water. So here a user is um, setting off a number of simulations. Uh, what's happening on the left? So there's one uh, storm model with 56 storm events. So what it's going to do is fire off 56 hydraulic simulations in the cloud. And here, this is the kind of thing that would have been either done on the user's local desktop or laptop machine or farmed off to a dedicated server. But instead, now you can see desktop's doing a little bit of pre-processing, preparing the model for the simulation and uh, uploading it. And you can see some of them in the status of waiting cloud. It's sitting on SQSQ somewhere, waiting for the uh, the tasks, the ECS tasks to pick the job up. You can see they're beginning to start simulating now. It's quite short simulations. So simulations can be run for seconds, but sometimes they can be run for weeks. So that's something I'll come back to because there's a that's a bit of a problem to solve. That sort of quite a disparate type of load that can that we have to manage. Um, you see them post processing, downloading. So each, each of those you saw there would be running up a task in ECS. And just to show you the end results, what you know, what, what's the point of doing this for the user? Here we're going to look at a, uh, this is a, a digital terrain model of um, some, I think a, possibly a fictional area, or I don't want to say where it is, but uh, if we uh, zoom in, we can take a picture, pick a particular manhole, we'll zoom in a bit closer, you can see the mesh, you can see the sort of boundaries of buildings and now we'll just start running the results of the simulations this is what the hydraulic models calculated for us you can see things like flow going over the surface um you know the, the engineer uh civil engineer will be using tools like this they can chart see depths at a particular point anywhere along the mesh or at a particular manhole or also they can um look at some detailed uh Figures if we just get this point, there's just the same sort of thing, different element, uh, the speed of the water over the surface, the depth, direction, and so on. So that's just a sort of two minute part of what, what, what's the point of all this? This is what the users, this is what our end users want to do and what they want to see, but they want uh, more of it and faster and larger scale. So that's what we're aiming to provide them. So I think we could probably go back to the 
architecture diagram now. So before, before, you, before you go back to the architecture, I want you to see if I can just get this right. What we mm -hmm. saw was a Windows machine, because that looked like a Windows interface for me, was, yeah. running a client native Windows application on, on the actual machine yeah. with, I would say, not a lot of horse, uh, horse, horsepower in the machine itself. No, no. Submitting a job which went up into the cloud, did all the computation, all the simulation, mm -hmm. pulled back all the results, and allowed yeah. you to view those results natively on the actual application on the on the on the actual client machine. Is that correct? Yeah, correct. Yeah. That's cool. So, That's really yeah. Nice. yeah. So how so, does this all work? How does it all work? Um, well, we look at this diagram, the sort of three main parts to the cloud side. We've got well, let's start with the on-premise bit. So that little box on the left, the simulation users, that was the that was that desktop you saw. Um, and it said we saw it was sending up uh, data to the cloud. Now there's some of the storage is in the cloud as well. It's not in this diagram, but it talks to good old API gateway, and we've got some handler lambdas, and they sort of manage all the jobs and look after the state of everything, and we use DynamoDB for that state. Um, but then the interesting bit is the job engine box, and that's CCS, and that's where all these tasks that do the simulation run. And um, yeah, the results then get written back to an S3 bucket, and that's how the the all the de detailed results get back to the to the desktop software. Um, yeah, so the the, the 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 you can see in the diagram that we're running a mixture of Fargate, which is obviously preferable. But if we can do it, we don't have to worry about um, scaling it. Uh, then we've also got what we call CPU and GPU jobs, and they'll be running on different types of EC2 instances. So that's the sort of overall flow of it and the main sort of components to do the simulation for the in the back end. Um, maybe, any, any questions there? Or can you go us to so, the next so, uh, Not a question, it's just more of an observation. I, I, I love the way that the fact that you actually made the use of the actual capabilities of the cloud in this case. So you said you have three different kinds of queues or three different sets of instances or compute kind of um, clusters, if you want to call them, or whatever it may be, mm -hmm. groups. Yeah. And each of them mm -hmm. use the resources which are actually specifically needed. So in other words, I don't need to run all my workloads on GPU, or yeah. I don't need to run all my workloads on Fargate. Some of them will make more sense of choosing a different kind of type and mixing and matching, giving you the most cost benefit. Which is very, yeah. very interesting. Yeah, that's right. Because um, as I mentioned before, some of the simulations could be just run for seconds, or some of them could be run for days. And the different types of simulation you do could be you're scaling out is what you want. Others are sort of scaling up. So an example of a sort of why we might want to scale out is like a water supply simulation where you're a water supply network. You might want to run a simulation to check what you know which links, which which pipes are most critical in your network. So it could be 10,000, thousands of thousands of simulations, but they'll all be very short running. And then you've got the other end of the scale is we've got um, you know a, a flood forecasting model over a large uh, mesh area, and, and that could take a, that requires multiple GPU cards to improve the performance uh, of the simulation. So we've got those sort of variations. Um, there's a, this sort of diagram, a couple of diagrams after this probably shows uh, that, that a bit better. Um, so we'll come back to this. We'll go to the next one, please, Boaz, um, because this will just go to Mesh's question, really. So here we've got we've got different job types, and a job type is really a combination of the engine type, so which kind of hydraulic engine. So we've got base containers for different types of simulation, and then we've got a compute size. So we've got to sort of match that job type to a compute size. So those are the two sort of variables. And we've got queues set up for each sort of permutation of engine type and compute size. And we've got uh, capacity providers. So either it'll just go on to Fargate, uh, which is um, already the capacity providers built into AWS, but also we set up um, EC2 capacity providers of the auto scale groups. So you can see this diagram. We've got we've got the sort of nominal sizes that we have, which is CPU medium, GPU medium, and GPU large. So depending what how big the simulation is, how much use you can make of a GPU card, we'll put it on. We'll select the the best compute type to put it onto. 
And how do you choose these different kinds of compute types? I mean, I mean, yes, you need a GPU, but how do you know which one is the most suitable for you? Which kind of EC2 yeah, it's not, is the most suitable? Yeah, it's not the exact science, but the water, the sort of water, water supply simulations you can fairly sure are going to run in Fargate. It gets more complicated with the storm sewer flood models, so it's a bit of it's a bit of heuristic, and also the user does get a little bit of input onto it. They could say they want to run it in the GPU instance. But we have to sort of look at the mesh size and um, yeah, there's a a bit a bit a little bit of a sort of guesswork really, which is which is going to work out the best. Yeah, one of the things yep. that I can add to that, maybe I can add to that, is that one of the things that we've invested quite a bit is that kind of being able to predict what would be the requirement from a simulation, and that's a, a that's a tough thing as well. That's kind of some of the the magic that happens here is that a simulation arrives to the service what kind of simulation that will be. And we looked at various parameters in that request, and then based on that, figure out some heuristics, as Alan mentioned, and just say, you know what, this fits CPU medium or something like that. Um, a, lot of, a lot of work went into that to make sure that we picked the right thing for the required um, simulation. So there was one question which came from the audience from Lakshmi, and I hope I'm not going to pull the full name in because I'm going to butcher it. So I forgive me. I'm going to leave it at Lakshmi. Um, do you have kind of a mechanism to distribute distribute uh, that load? In other words, I assume the, the, the request comes into an API gateway. If we go to the previous slide, we'll see that it comes into an API gateway and from there into a queue. Yeah. And based on the size or the the type of, is there any way which um, mo uh, modulates a different kind of key to where that actual um, request goes to or where it's picked up from? Yeah, yeah, that was a, a difficult problem to uh, sort out. Um, yeah, we have what we call a fair queuing system um, and it's based off uh, the number of sort of uh, jobs that a user has already submitted. So it's kept track of in DynamoDB uh, and so we do things like, you know, say one user submits 250 simulations, another user comes along a few seconds later. Um, while those sort of things are scaling up to pick up those 250 jobs, the person just wants to do one little simulation, they will get bumped up and uh, get in front. Because um, obviously, you know, we will scale up, but it takes time. So we don't want people who just want to do a little job. So... Yes, it's a round, sort of round robin based approach with various weightings and how far up the uh, the, the queue yeah. you can get. I'll I'll add to that something that we've we've had in our minds uh, quite a bit, and that is the multi-tenant uh, uh, solution here to make sure that our customers don't feel that noisy neighbor problem, uh, because. You know, one customer might be hammering the system and is really using that to the max, but at the same time, someone else needs a result very quickly. So a lot of effort went into to do smart queuing where each user feels that they've got their entire system for, for themselves. Now, that's the fairness queue. And as you start thinking about the kind of situation where you can get to, uh, that becomes quite difficult to, to manage. But... I'd say that we've got to a point where in a lot of cases, customers don't feel, or in most cases, they don't feel that there's anyone else using the system, which has been a really uh, a core part of what we wanted to build. Yeah, well, one thing probably worth pointing out uh, that may, may be different in a lot of your people watching this container loads is we only actually run one task for EC2 instance. So we're not packing lots of tasks because the only reason we fall back to using EC2 rather than Fargate is because they're compute intensive and memory intensive jobs. So you just, we just one to one between EC2 and the task that's running on the instance. Uh, and there's other reasons are that the engines themselves are multi-threaded. So, and they perform much better if they've got full access to all the CPU cores and, and GPUs as well. So there's no, we don't really get a benefit of trying to sort of pack lots of tasks onto instances. Cool. Yeah, um, we could talk about just you know, what's inside the container a little bit, if you like, which was the- Yeah, please, um, if we could. Yeah, next, next slide. So the, the, the um, yeah, back one, back one, Boaz, I think. 
that one. Yeah, I'll just talk about what sort of in what what we're running in these containers, um, whether this be on Fargate or EC2, it's the same same container. So we talked about we've got these bait these uh, native executables that are written by we've got other you know, within the team we've got specialist sort of math, more math, mathematician uh, type software engineers you know know all the fluid dynamics and write and maintain all these the the uh, native code that does the computation um, those get containerized and then we take those as base containers and basically mix in what I call sort of glue glue layer to run these native executables so we use this is where node.js comes in um, we use the AWS SDK and that's what sort of hooks that whole process into the input you know the S3 bucket and the output bucket and um, and and also connecting to the job table in a dyno db and also you can see this diagram uh we do we use efs to so when jobs come back around again or they're killed now we're not actually using spot instances yet but you know that will be necessary that's the the persistent storage between invocations of tasks will be used for that um, so that's sort of what that's what we're running in the container and I might be leading or keep providing a what's name, uh, what they say, giving you a question which you can answer very easily. But I assume, as you said, the product was already on use on prem. So was this always in, in Linux? Because it looks to me like it's a Linux container today, whatever. It's a little relatively small. Yeah. You probably came from some kind of a background before which wasn't Linux. So so how did you handle that, that, that um, transition from, mm -hmm. because, Windows containers work perfectly also on ECS and on Fargate, but they have their, I would say, challenges. It's a nice way yeah. to put it. Mm -hmm. so, so how did you handle that, that transition? Yeah, that's right. So you, you did you did spot that it was running on a Windows machine in that um, demo, but even the dedicated server hardware that people use with GPU cards in them are generally run on Windows machines as well. So for a long time, primarily the, the uh, engines were built for Windows. So obviously when we decided to we want to run these executables or processes in the cloud, your containers is the obvious thing if you want to do it at scale and in the cloud. So we did have a bit of a choice. You know, we could have just started using Windows containers or we'd port this code to, to Linux. Um, see a bit niche, the Windows, using Windows for, unless you really needed to. And obviously the expense as well. My, was going to be a lot more expensive to, to run on Windows. So, and because it's kind of low layers, most of this code is written in the engines written C++ Fortran. So it is quite portable and, you know, we use Intel compilers and other GCC and it just wasn't really that hard a job to port it to Linux. So that just seemed like the best option to do at the time. And that's what, that's what we did. And uh, yeah, we sort of look, look back now really. <laughs> Yeah, one. This is one of the, the the reasons why we really looked at a born in the cloud kind of work rather than a lift and shift, because a a full on lift and shift would have required us to replicate the exact structure of what we had on prem, then lift that to the cloud, which would require the, the move of lots of Windows servers and 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 of sorts. Once we took out and we said, you know what, we're going to do a cloud native solution. And just take the the small bits that we needed. It really made it easier for us to just pull out these engines and say, you know what? If these engines can run on Linux, that's a small enough piece that we can transfer to to Linux. And it turns out that once you take something that is quite big and just pull the important part that you need from it, tra transferring that from Windows to Linux was not such of a big deal. Yeah, it's an interesting question because. Beyond the engine, there is sort of pre-processing and post-processing of data before, before it goes in and out of the engine. Um, we're getting sort of other bits now where do you rewrite some of those things again into like Node.js and TypeScript or whatever, or do we, because there are some bits are still in Windows that aren't part of the engine, but sort of go fairly hand in hand with it. Do we rewrite those? And it's getting sort of more difficult because they're a little bit more tied in with, with more uh, Windows-specific features, perhaps, and 
whereas the engines really weren't that hard to uh, port. But I think the as I, it's, it's not the first time that I've heard a customer saying, okay, we're not going to do what we replicate what we had on prem, even though it's what we know very well, we know how to do it, but we'd rather gain the benefits, as you said, of using the native services, the managed services, none of to manage those things on our own. And yes, it does include the fact of you kind of peel the onion in a certain way, as we would like to call it, take off layer by layer and move whatever you can slowly but surely by taking it, that big monolith apart and putting it into different pieces, my different microservices. Um, and that that way allows you to actually move forward with your application further with your integration. Correct. Yeah, uh, I, yeah I, I can add to that is like sometimes that that uh, that that uh, desire to do a lift and shift very quickly is from a desire to get something out of the market very quickly, and you feel that that's yep. going to be the shortest path. Now, to some applications, this might work, but here we really wanted to make sure that not only that first step is going to be good to market. Uh, but the subsequent steps after that uh, and the transition and the additional features that we will build after that first, after that initial feature parity would be fast to go to market and would be effective. So uh, we've made a conscious decision right there in the, in the beginning because this is a central service for our customers, for our company. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we go all out and we see the dividends today where our ability to add features is very simple. Uh, our ability to add additional services and to transfer other capabilities from other parts of our software to this has been really uh, easy and straightforward just because we made that initial decision, which took some, you know, one part is the part of just building out capabilities that you've already built in the on-prem solution, uh, but also this is team culture and capabilities of the actual software engineering team to be able to do things that are slightly different. And I have to say, this is a great thing to see where teams are able to just take on that new challenge, learn the capabilities of a, of a cloud and just go all in on a new language, a new infrastructure and just run with that. Yeah, that sounds really good. So so you talk about adopting a new language, a new infrastructure. So I, I'm sure that this whole architecture and this whole product that you developed in the cloud has always has not always been pink and red, red roses smelling beautiful perfume. There are probably challenges that you, you encountered. So can you share with the audience some of the challenges you encounter with, with either in your regular day to day or by the actual design of the system? Yeah. Uh, well, one of the challenges that was probably well, we got maybe a slightly novel way of uh, managing it is the um, scaling. So, I mean, sort of out of the box thing you might want to do with ECS is using, you know, this, the CPU or memory um, metrics or set up some um, CloudWatch rules. But just because we're, we're not trying to scale so many tasks on instances. Um, and this is, so obviously Fargate will scale for us fine. It's just when we're talking again about the running the EC2 instances. So, and we want to have a number of hot instances because sometimes getting these EC2 images can take a little bit of time, particularly some of the large GPU instances you don't get yeah. right away. Um, we need to keep a few hot, but we want to sort of scale up. And the way, basically when a new job gets, um, Submitted, we will you use the Lambda use the SD, uh, SDK to do a run task on whatever picking the right um, uh, compute to use, and we'll start a new task. And that task will start coming up. As soon as that task uh, picks up a job, it will launch another task. So there's a natural sort of scaling up, and it's keeping track of a sort of idle table. And eventually, after a while, there's sort of a probability that if it starts getting more and more idle tasks, then the task will just end itself. Um, so that was just a sort of different way we did of scaling up, which definitely kept lots of hot instances, but without too many. And also whenever a surge came, it, it scaled up the way we wanted it to and had control over it and, and depend, because it depended again on which kind of compute job, how long you wanted the task to wait around for before it's all sort of scaled back down. 
uh, and also sort of resourcing problem we had is again for sort of GPU instances. Uh, I mean, there are plenty of GPU instances of around, but unfortunately, the engine, some of the engine code is actually quite tied to specific types of GPU because we need various CUDA capabilities. It's the NVIDIA CUDA library that they're they're built on, so we can't just sort of take any any um, uh, necessarily any GPU type. Uh, so what we've done is if it does, if we do struggle to get a GPU instance, we have what are called secondary regions. So where, say for example, we're using uh, London as a primary region, we'll start doing simulations in Dublin if we can't get GPU instances. So that, that was sort of a problem we came across and solved by uh, going doing something cross region, which obviously don't tend to want to do, but in this instance, that was the best best solution. Yeah, and the interesting thing is, of course, it's, and I, that's one of the things, the global things we say, one of the reasons of moving to the cloud, you can go global, global in seconds. In other words, it's the same code, the same artifacts that you're using, the same CI CD pipeline. You don't have to learn something completely new. You just have to point it to another region with mm -hmm. the specific parameters, and you can tie those things back together again, one to another, which is very, very, very useful for customers like you. Yeah, it was interesting for for us that this uh, regional uh, regional uh, uh, to move to 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 secondary region, we had to clump together regions that we call the mega regions, uh, because still we have some requirements from our customers to stay within a close enough region for legal reasons and others as well. So that's an interesting part. Uh, so we've worked with our customers to make sure that once we expand to a secondary region, that secondary region is still within what they feel is appropriate for their workload as well. Um, so that, that's that been a great experience. Uh, working working also with the, with the AWS account team to really identify the availability of specific instance type within a region. What's the average, so forth. How can you uh, uh, get that and so forth. Um, but yeah, this was this specific issue with uh, uh, sometimes everybody going to get the GPU instance to run large scale um, mm. AI uh, training. Chat GPT somewhere, whatever, those kind of things. things like that. So happened to yeah. be the same, same need. Uh, yeah, an another thing we have to be quite careful of going back to the point of the, the, the engines being quite sort of fussy about what they run on because you can't get you know the computational models, you can get different results. Is we've got to be quite careful about rolling out to use new new instance types as AWS makes them available and new GPU types. We can't just sort of go, oh, that's that's the new ones. Even just look at specs and go, we yeah, will choose that. It's you know going to be faster. We have to carefully make sure that it works properly. So we have what's called sort of shadow queues as well. So uh, for a little while, we'll whenever a job submitted, we'll do it on the the normal whatever compute size has got, but we'll have a little shadow version of it doing exactly the same simulation with the customer, you know, whatever customers submitted that job. And then we can check for a little while and obviously costs more to do that. We're running the same simulation twice, but that's how we sort of roll out and make sure that everything's right before we sort of jump on a new new instance type. Boss, well, can you go back one second, one slide further back? Because I saw there were, uh several services that you're using for example cloudfront and s3 and api gateway and sqs and of course ecs running on fargate on our nec2 um was it always like this did you for example and um, why did you choose ecs put it this way because there's also other container solutions outside today where not for example eks where you can use also contain elastic Kubernetes service so i would like to hear what was the reason or the criteria that you decided to go uh, go for, for ECS, either Alan or Boaz? Yeah, I'll start. Maybe, Alan, you can add to that. Mm -hmm. the, the main goal for us was to be able to run in the most simple way for the need that we had. We knew from the get-go that we will not be running a very heterogeneous infrastructure of containers. We knew that that's not the case. If I look at the rest of our cloud solution, there are no containers. It's all Lambda-based uh, and serverless solutions. Uh, and this is when we zoom into this part, remember, 
as I mentioned, we've got a number of different products that are part of the, of the cloud. In this one, that's the only place that we use containers. So we, I knew, or we knew from the get-go that we would not have a huge heterogeneous type of uh, container cloud or container infrastructure. Therefore, our requirement was, let's see what can get us there in the simplest way. And when we look at different options, we saw, you know, ECS, just because you've got the Fargate side and then ECS seem to be the simplest way to do that. Yeah, I mean, I agree totally. That's that in a nutshell, it's just the simplicity. I mean, at the start, we did do some prototype and experimentation with EKS, uh, but, you know, we didn't have any particular expertise in Kubernetes that we, you know, we wanted to use or needed. And, uh, and we weren't bringing some on-premise Kubernetes or we weren't trying to be cloud agnostic, you know. So we just wanted something that, uh, that did the job at ECS does. It's AWS, you know, scales. It's part of a closely integrated with um, AWS services. So really there was, uh, well, we thought, we, you know, if things got too complicated, you know, something we could do, but after a few years, it's, I don't think it's, it's an extremely unlikely that we're going to use EKS at this, EKS at this point. Uh, EKS has served us really well. And of course, to make this clear, there of course are very good reasons to use choose either one of the solutions. And there are customers who are very happy with using this EK, with ECS or EKS or using both of them together for yeah. different use cases. What I always think, and I always um, try and advice customers is don't choose a technology based on what the technology is. Choose a technology or a tool which will solve your problem in the easiest way. And if yeah. that tool in that case or specific case would be EKS or ECS, then so be it, whatever is good for you. Um, and that's what usually a lot of customers are, 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 are of that mindset. And hopefully more customers will be more of that, of that mindset in the future. Uh, because and the thing is that they have the option to choose, specifically within mm -hmm. a, within AWS, they have the option to choose pretty much whatever whatever they would like. As we say, from Fargate, from Lambda to Fargate to ECS to EKS, they can choose whatever they would like, and that is why the customers love the services. Yeah, exactly. Pick the simplest one that will fit yeah. what it is that you're trying to achieve. And uh, I, I, what I'm seeing that with the the the, the uh, what we've picked here actually served that purpose really well. Yeah, so, so we're talking about being simple. I mean, I, I, I might be worth mentioning AWS Batch, which is just a, adds another sort of layer of simplicity and on top of ECS. Now, it wasn't suitable for the control we needed over the simulations, but we do use AWS Batch for some of the other processing jobs we do, where it's just simple. We just hook it up to EventBridge run some containers on it that we just know and just pile up the queue and get the results back and we're not not sort of fine-grained about you know doing doing it so that's um no we do use a bit of aws batch as well so we had a question coming in from blue de chanel or blue de chanel i don't know how you mentioned that in french or in english but forgive me again for butchering names that's what i do all the time how do you deal with testing? As that, you mentioned something with the fact of your shadow instances to run for testing. So um, yeah. that would be part one part of the component. But I'm saying there's not only the fact of running one specific GPU. So how does the testing mechanism work? Or if you yeah. give more information on the methodology you use? Yeah, well, yeah, that's a good question. But <laughs> well, yeah, well, one thing is that shadow testing is one way of testing new, new instances. Yeah, we just run a lot of end-to-end uh, -end tests from we actually just use, use Jest running in Node.js to automate a lot of tests. Either we do tests through through that REST API, we can see the the, the, the diagram like simulating what the desktop software would do, run it through, check results, um, and also sort of more uh, a sort of the end-to-end -end test level, but well, an integration test level, we're probably using Jest, but with the AWS SDK to put things in queues. But, uh, yeah, it's just really just running running all of that thing with Jest, um, Node.js. Uh, that's that's in and then unit tests of the Node.js code. And um, yeah, then we have we do have QA teams that will further test the software. Uh, 
Yes, test, test after test after test. Yes. Yeah, I'll add, I'll add you. That. Yeah, I'll add to that. I'll add to that. Some of the complex, I wouldn't say complexity, but I'd say uh, some of the things that are really important in testing a solution like this is making sure that you understand what happens at scale when things don't go don't go as you plan. Uh, and we've mentioned the GPU instances and things like that, and that's how we found out during testing that when you try to scale very quickly to large set of instances then you might hit that limit you've got not no availability of instances and things like that so that's exactly where you need that api end-to-end -end testing because that requires uh, or that activates all of the pieces in that puzzle and you make sure that you can uh, overcome that and we've got quite a set of tests that are running effectively uh, all the time making sure that this entire system works. So that's one testing on one side before we push new capabilities to production, but also we've got monitoring that makes sure yeah. that that's, that entire thing is always mm -hmm. up and running, ready to serve requests. That's right, yeah. So even after the test, then the next next layer is the, the monitor, monitoring. We've got to keep careful, uh, look at that carefully. I mean, that, that I've been earlier points where we've got the heuristics wrong about which kind of model we could put on onto instances and it's it's just run out of memory or something like that so we've got to be aware then then you obviously put tests into uh for the next time you don't want to do that again we are coming to the end of our hour and um i wanted to um pretty much firstly thank you for 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 sharing this architecture with us and your story it is um always amazes me what firstly what things can run on the cloud or solutions that me and my little self running containers or streaming on video or writing code or deploying things usually do, do. And you find all these interesting companies and technologies which our customers are using to build to build their products on AWS. So thank you very much for sharing that. Is there anything you would like to, before we close out today, um, leave us with before, before we to share with our customers how people can find you, if they want to learn more about your product, yeah, absolutely. So first of all, for our products, it's on autodesk.com. You go through and you look for the water uh, solutions. Uh, we are constantly improving our products and getting more capabilities out. So track us on there. Yeah, you can uh, uh, um, look me up on LinkedIn. It's Boaz Brodner uh, if you're looking for other things as well. Um, I think that the last thing that I wanted to, to, to make sure I keep everybody with uh, it, the way we work is always looking at the requirements backwards. Um, it's not technology that leads. It's not what you can do. It's not what's available. It is, this is what I need to get for our, my customers to work. And then let's see how we can fulfill that in the best way. So that's another factor because there is, there is, there are a lot of different services that can perform different things. You really need in nowadays just to figure out what's right for you. Alan, yeah. any final yeah, words? Just to sort of, yeah, uh, thanks to a few of the people in the team that you know, just, I'm just one representative of it. So say hi to Nick, my boss, and thanks to Roger, Gary, James, Jason, Anya, and then there's lots of others that you know help make it all work. So that's all really. And thank you both. Thank you also to our audience who was here on this, on the chat with us for asking questions, interacting. Um, um, it's always good to see people also returning um, customers and viewers as well is also awesome. Um, if you have any questions, either regarding containers, ECS, Fargate, or anything we discussed here or any of the other shows, you can always find me on LinkedIn. Please don't forget to hit the subscribe button on the, on the YouTube channel so you can get notified about our future um, broadcasts and future episodes. We hear every Thursday at the same hour which comes out to be 12 o'clock Pacific, pretty much about 10 o'clock my time, but it's okay, no worries. Um, and we'll see you again next week on Containers on the Couch. Thank you again, Boaz. Thank you very much, Alan, for joining Thank us today. You. Thank Bye. you. It's great. Have a good day. Thank Bye. you.